we're about to find out. My name is Ronaldo Blake, and I am a research assistant at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. CAPRI is an independent think tank devoted to evidence-based research towards improved public policymaking in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Today, we are excited to launch our latest report, Who Cares? The Real Cost of Unpaid Care and Domestic Work. This report marks a seminal moment in our understanding of the Jamaican care economy as it is the first comprehensive monetary estimate of unpaid domestic and care work. In fact, it is the first time this important work is being valued in economic terms at all. And its value is significant, as the report will soon reveal. Capri did an indicative study on the care economy in 2018, the first research in Jamaica on this important sector. That report was the seed from which has blossomed three follow-up studies, this report being the first of the three. All three studies are supported by the European Union under their civil society organizations as actors of governance and development program. The EU has remained a steadfast partner of Capri in our 15 years of existence as it continues to support Jamaica and the region in our developmental goals. In just a moment, I will welcome the EU's Piotr Bishkowski to deliver brief remarks. We will then have a presentation of the report and its main findings by Capri's economics researcher, the lead author of the study, Priya Alexander. Following the presentation, we'll move immediately into an exciting panel discussion moderated by Capri's executive director, Dr. Damien King. Dr. King will be joined by Dr. Heather Ricketts, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies, Mono. The panel will be completed by report author Priya Alexander. We encourage members of our virtual audience to participate in the discussion by submitting their questions online using Slido. To do so, visit slido.com and enter the event code Capri, after which you will have the option to post or upvote questions you deem crucial for our panelists to respond to. I now welcome Mr. Piotr Bishkowski, Charge d'Affaires of the European Union delegation to Jamaica, to deliver some brief remarks on behalf of the European Union. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Damien King and his team at Capri for giving me the opportunity to welcome all of you to the presentation and panel discussion on this research report on the value of unpaid care and domestic work. This is the seventh in a serious report prepared by Capri with the financial support of the European Union as part of a project that we call Civil Society Organization and Actor of Governance and Development. This project aims to improve governance and accountability by stimulating policy innovation and enhancing policy responsiveness in the areas of women's empowerment, your advocacy and economic inclusion. Our support to civil society organization and academia aims to help them to be voice of the marginalized. Around the world, women typically spend disproportionately more time on unpaid care work in the home that men do. A lot care and domestic work is acknowledged as essential in supporting our economies and societies, is generally goes unrecognized in the homes and remains largely invisible in statistics and policy decision. However, it is important to note that one of the targets of goal five of the sustainable development goals, which deals with gender equality is to recognize and value and paid care and domestic work and to tackle persistent gender inequalities as a necessary foundation for inclusive growth and development. Countries that sign up to the SDGs made this commitment and should honor it. In the EU, legislation aimed at addressing the gender gap in unpaid care and facilitating work-life balance 
is due to become national law in 2022. A new European care strategy being proposed and expected to include revised EU targets on child care provision and recommendation on long-term care. The EU gender equality strategy for 2020-2025 identifies closing gender gaps in caring roles as a priority and urge the member states to invest in child care. In Jamaica, a time-use study undertaken with the 2018 Jamaica survey of living condition already demonstrated the importance of unpaid care and domestic work for the development of the country. Building on the data and on a previous EU-funded 2017 CAPRI report on barriers to women's participation in the labor market, this new research can effectively contribute to stimulating the debate and ultimately lead to the introduction of nationality appropriate policy and programs to address uh, these major barriers to gender equality and women's economic empowerment. I look forward to hear the finding and the discussion that will follow. If unpaid care work, which involves caring for household members, and unpaid domestic work, which involves doing household chores, were to be part of Jamaica's GDP, its value will be more than the combined value of agriculture, manufacturing, mining, construction, and utilities. That such a large share of economic activities unpaid is a problem. Unpaid care and domestic work is an important aspect of economic activity and the well-being of individuals. If no one had children and no one took care of their families, economies would come to a halt for a lack of a labor force. However, the economic value of unpaid care and domestic work is largely unknown. In keeping with the UN Sustainable Goals Target 5.4, which is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls through recognizing and valuing unpaid care and domestic work, this study quantifies this work. Before now, there has not been a valuation of unpaid care and domestic work in Jamaica. This study is the first of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. First, let's start off with some definitions. What is unpaid care work and what is unpaid domestic work? Unpaid care work focuses on the care support of the members in a household, including those who are disabled or permanently dependent, and it has just one activity, which is just caregiving. On the other hand, unpaid domestic work focuses on the welfare of the members in a household and it consists of performing several distinct household activities such as cooking, cleaning, laundry, collecting water, among others. Now let's move on to two words to describe what is important about unpaid work. The first is unequal. Time use data clearly shows that as is the pattern throughout the world, Women bear the largest responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work. They do far more unpaid work and less paid work than men do, regardless of how you disaggregate it, by income level, age, or geographical location. Second is in invisible. Unpaid work remains statistically invisible to many policymakers, economists, and planners because this type of work is not compensated by a payment. It falls outside of the conventional definitions of what counts as work, and as such, it falls outside of the boundary of the system of national accounts that is used to calculate the common measure of total output, GDP. As I mentioned before, unpaid work is such a large share of economic activity, and this is a problem. Why is it a problem? Firstly, personal welfare is affected the significant and unequal amount of time that women dedicate to unpaid care and domestic work means that their care and domestic activities may carry an opportunity cost. They are prevented from realizing their potential earnings and career objectives because unpaid work reduces their ability to participate in and dedicate more time to paid work. Secondly, there's a misallocation of productive resources or human capital. For example, Women who may possess more skills than is required for performing unpaid care and domestic duties 
end up with their skills being underutilized. Skills that can allow them to participate more fully in the formal labor market and contribute to national productivity. Now, why should we evaluate unpaid work? Capturing the market value of unpaid work brings several gains. Firstly, the valuation of unpaid work provides a more accurate measure of society's output by revealing the existence of a part of the economy that would otherwise remain in invisible, but is just as valuable as a regularly measured part. Secondly, knowing the value of unpaid work shows what a return on investment in reducing the burden of such work might yield in terms of the potential for women and men to do more paid work. For example, in the case of investing in providing care support for families, research has shown that a decrease in women's unpaid care work is related to a 10 percentage point increase in women's labor force participation rate. Therefore, a reduction in unpaid care work can lead to an increase in the number of women doing paid work. Thirdly, Knowing the value of unpaid work can inform considerations about the marketization of some of those activities where the market for childcare and other care services in Jamaica is apparently underdeveloped. Now, there may be constraints and limitations to the growth of the care sector, such as scarcity of trained caregivers, lack of availability and affordability of physical infrastructure, such as buildings, and lack of funds to cover the initial startup cost of care centers. While there may be a need to better understand these constraints and limitations, having a substantiated idea of the value of the sector would be key to thinking through what policy initiatives would best serve to strengthen it. Lastly, recognition of the value of unpaid work can improve the status of carers and their commitment to care work. When unpaid care work is valued and recognized, it will elevate the status of people who perform these jobs and give them the incentive to want to execute their duty more effectively, carefully, and intentionally. Now that we have laid out some of the reasons for the valuation of unpaid work, let's focus on how the value of unpaid work is calculated. In this study, the value of unpaid care and domestic work was found by using an input-based replacement cost approach. What does this mean? Simply, it means multiplying the number of hours spent in unpaid care and domestic activities by the hourly wages of the specific occupational groups for each type of care and domestic activity. Now, the main source of data for the time spent in care and domestic activities was extracted from the time use survey conducted by the joint efforts of the Statistical Institute of Jamaica and the Planning Institute of Jamaica in 2018. For the calculation of the wages mentioned, three wage approaches were applied, the generalist, the specialist, and a minimum wage approach. The minimum wage approach assigns a national minimum wage to all activities. The, general, the generalist wage approach assigns one wage to all activities. The specialist wage approach assigns different wages to the relevant specialized care and domestic activities based on the actual market wage rate for each job. Using these different wage approaches to value unpaid care and domestic work, it is estimated to be 15 to 45 percent of Jamaica's 2022 GDP. With the minimum wage approach, the estimated annual value is 340 billion Jamaican dollars, which is 15 percent of GDP. Using the generalist wage approach, the estimated annual value is 628 billion Jamaican dollars, which is 30 percent of GDP. Using the specialist wage approach, the estimated annual value is 991 billion Jamaican dollars, which is 45% of GDP. For each of these methods, women accounted for two thirds of the value of unpaid work. Now, disaggregating and valuing unpaid work by activity type, it is seen that caring for children aged zero to five has the highest contribution of all care activities at 94 billion Jamaican dollars, which is equivalent to 4% of GDP. Preparing and serving of food has the highest contribution of all domestic activities at 258 billion Jamaican dollars, which is equivalent to 12% of GDP. Even at the lowest possible wage rate, the value of unpaid care and domestic work in Jamaica is significant. 
but this value is not easily recognized or expressed. By calculating and having a dollar figure for its value, the true contribution of unpaid care and domestic work to the economy is revealed. Once again, unpaid care and domestic work, once recognized and measured, has value. The implication is that by converting unpaid work to paid work, whether by measures to reduce unpaid work or by the marketization of some care and domestic work services, some of that value will be realized in a more efficient allocation of resources with a consequential increase in average labor productivity and thereby a greater GDP. We therefore put together two recommendations for women's unpaid work to be reduced and redistributed. Firstly, the state should subsidize the care economy by issuing vouchers to working parents for use at daycare and nursing care facilities. For example, through the Program of Advancement through Health and Education path, which could be redeemed at approved and registered care providers. Secondly, state agencies should take the lead in offering childcare support at the workplace and or support for their unpaid work obligations and private sector employers should be incentivized by the state to provide support for their employees with care obligations. Thank you, Priya. And welcome everyone. The first thing I want to do before I introduce our panelists for this discussion, I want to redirect you to slido.com where you can register the event code Capri, and you can participate in the discussion by not only posing questions of your own for the panelists, but also to vote on questions that are put in by others if you are particularly keen on getting those questions answered. I'm Damian King, and I have the privilege of hosting our panelists who are Dr. Heather Ricketts, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies, yeah. and uh, a researcher who is critical to this whole exercise of measuring how people use their time. And Ms. Priya Alexander, who is the lead researcher at Capri on this work that we have produced. I would like to ask viewers to go to slider.com now because we are going to put up a poll question. We are surveying viewers to get their opinions on how much does having to look after small children or an elderly parent or relative or a disabled person get in the way of you being able to earn a living, you being able to earn more income. So if you could go to slider.com now and answer that poll question and we'll show the results in a bit. Heather, Priya, thank you very much. Capri is all about evidence-based policymaking. Mm -hmm. And you can't provide the evidence until you have data to analyze. And all of this work was possible because a few years ago, the Statistical Institute conducted a survey on how people use their time. Mm -hmm. And that's really the starting point and you are critical in getting that done. So just help us out by how you managed to get this done. How did you talk them into, into providing this tremendous resource for us? Damian, that's a great first question. So I sit on the technical steering committee of the Survey of Living Conditions, and I had been trying myself and two other colleagues, Colin Williams and Kristen Fox, we'd been trying to get the a time use module in the survey since about 2000 and I would say either eight or 10. So it was about a, either an eight or 10 year journey trying to get this time use survey in. Uh, one thing was um, a problem, the cost of the module. It cost to, 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 to conduct a, a, a survey. And so Statin was a little bit concerned that the length of time that it would have taken to field an additional survey may have compromised the quality of the data that they would normally collect because you had to pay attention to things like interviewer fatigue and respondent fatigue. 
So we had to cut the very ambitious um, plans that we had to poll, or sorry, not poll, but to, to, to interview, survey for, uh, 14 year olds and over. We had to cut that to 18 and older in a household. We wanted to actually speak to 14 year olds, uh, well, all household members 14 years and older. And we wanted to ask them about each day. Well, of course, we couldn't ask about the entire week. So we had to dial back to speaking only to adult members of the household, 18 years and older, and asking about one day of the week. Um, and this took perhaps about an additional 25 to 30 minutes of the normal mm -hmm. field time. Because the field of survey of living conditions is anywhere between two and a half hours and three and a half hours. And it requires a number of go-backs. So you have to call back. Sometimes you have to go back to one household three or four times to find all members. And so Statin was really very concerned about that. And then the additional um, cost of training interviewers and field supervisors, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Um, we were able to convince them eventually. We had to do a number of pretests to prove that it would not have taken far more time that would then compromise the quality of the data they would normally collect. And, um, and then, you know, having brought the argument that, look, we're going to be able to have some measure of SDG goal five, particularly indicator 5.4.1 we were able to get the committee to agree. So it was a lot of negotiating, a lot of going back to the drawing board, and we ended up with this, um, what we considered to be quite a, a good, you know, survey instrument. Brilliant. Or module. We, we are extremely grateful. Listening to Priya's presentation, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, what makes up uh, unpaid care work and unpaid domestic work, mm -hmm will sound to some listeners like, well, those are just things you do because you're living. Whereas you see it as so important mm -hmm. as to dedicate 10 years to getting the data. Yes. So, so why, why is unpaid care and domestic work so important? Well, first, time is a source of utility. Mm -hmm. um, unpaid care and domestic work, if it is, if, if it, well, it, is largely done by women and it compromises women's ability to engage in the labor market in paid work women have a double burden those who engage in paid work and have to come and engage themselves in unpaid care and domestic work it is a double burden for them nobody you know on, what unpaid care and domestic work does is that it makes other work possible, you know. And so by the work that Priya has done, by valuing this, it takes it out of the shadows. That invisibility you talk about and that, you know, um, not, not um, recognizing unpaid care and domestic work. Um, that, that measurement of its value is very important to an economy. Because if nobody engages in unpaid care and domestic work, no other work really is possible. Yes. So one has to value that this is a condition. This is something that is allowing other activities to be possible in a labor market. And so it's important. Yeah, that invisibility thing is critical because... Uh, as a lot of people already appreciate what you don't measure on count, you know. Absolutely. So, yes. You know. Excellent. You know, um, Priya, if, if, if this measurement is so important and it's, it's economic activity, why is it not in GDP? Um, yes, it is important, I agree. But it's not, in, it's not measured in, in the GDP because it, it is not considered as work. It's not counted as work. It falls outside of the conventional definitions of what counts as work. So that is why it's not measured in, in the GDP. I would imagine another another part of that is that in any case, GDP doesn't measure anything that doesn't have a price. GDP's definition True. is it must have a price. Yes. It, you know, so it must mm -hmm. be a market activity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I guess that that, that enhances 
why why it is so important. So so let's 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 look at um, sort of the analytical side of this now. The study prayer, as as you presented it, gave a range of estimates of the value that varied, you know, quite greatly between fifteen percent of GDP and four to five percent of GDP. So why such a large range and if i were to push you mm -hmm. to say you know is the is the bottom end more accurate or the top end more accurate which is the one that you want me to sort of fix my mind around okay so for the minimum wage approach this provides the the the, the lower end estimate of the value of unpaid work mm -hmm. and this is because we used the minimum wage which is the lowest wage out of all the approaches that we used. So, so we can visualize it as being at the lower end of the spectrum. Now, the specialist wage approach, this provides the, the upper end estimate of the value of unpaid work. And this is because for each care and domestic activity, we assigned a wage for its equivalent job in the formal labor market. Mm -hmm. So for example, someone who is preparing food they would be assigned the wage of a cook or a chef in the formal labor market, or someone who is taking care of someone who is dis disabled or permanently dependent. They would be assigned the wage of a nurse. So for this, this approach, I would say that there's no real consensus on the best fit. So I would say it can lead to an overestimation. Now for the generalist wage approach, um, it assigns a wage for, of, for example, a domestic worker. A domestic worker can, can complete all of these activities, all of the care and domestic activities. So I would say this is probably the approach that we can say is the most accurate. So I would say the generous wage approach. But what occurs to me as, as you are describing that you are valuing the activity at what somebody who specializes in that activity yes would would cost mm -hmm. but that that seems to suggest that there's a greater loss because the person who might be forced to carry out that activity that activity mm -hmm. might be you know uh, an accountant or a lawyer right mm -hmm. and so the loss to the economy yes is actually much greater than that mm -hmm. right and so in a sense isn't it also an underestimate it is an underestimate, and what you're referring to is actually called the output method, mm -hmm. which is something that we did not explore in this, in this report. Mm -hmm. So what we can do for further research is actually using this method, mm -hmm. but the input method is actually considered superior. That's mm -hmm. why we used it in this report. Mm -hmm. Do we have any results here from the survey that we posted? We asked if, you know, if, if, you ha if looking after small children or the elderly, you know, is 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 constraining your ability to to earn a, a living. Do we have any results on that we can show yet? Okay, so two thirds of respondents say that it constrains their their ability to earn very much. So it it really corroborates you know what we found in the report. Mm -hmm. uh, that estimate. Now, we did that estimate for Jamaica, but Priya, just give us an idea. Did you have an idea of what, of what the value of, the, of unpaid care work and, and domestic work is in other countries? Yes, um, for each country, the value varies. But I would say I would be careful in comparing the value of unpaid work in one country to another country. And I say this because the variation between countries, it reflects the differences in the amount of time spent in the in unpaid care and domestic work and also the wages applied mm -hmm. so i would be careful in comparing one country to another one element of this which you mentioned in your presentation and you brought out straight away is the is the gender dimension of it yes which is actually a critical part of this whole mm -hmm. whole exercise uh and i wanted to talk about that a bit but we we went out on the street mm -hmm. and we asked uh, people to, to tell us how they are managing having to do with this, you know, to, to, to be burdened by, by care and, domestic, and work. domestic work. 
And this is one of the opinions that we got. No mistake, I'm here where it's the responsibility of only the woman, or should it be shared between the man and the woman? No, I believe it should Look be shared. Lower. No, I believe it should be shared because at the end of the day, no woman no want a dirty man, and no man no want a dirty woman. And if it's shared work together, it's done so quick and so easy. It's not because you say you're a man, you're not clean. Well, there you have it. So j just elaborate for me, Heather, on why this, this gender dimension of it is so critical. Well, I'm a sociologist. And so, you know, my sociology is going to come out here. Um, gender socialization practices lead to a gender division of labor in the home. So we know that girls have indoor work and girls' work has tended to be domestic work and care work, while boys perform more outdoor activities. We've seen work by Chavans and Gale and Anderson and Janet Brown, etc., for Jamaica. So we know this. The data from the time use module for Jamaica showed that women in Jamaica spend four and a half hours per day in unpaid care and domestic work. And that's 2.2 times more than males do in unpaid care and domestic work. And to a large extent, what is um, taking their time? Looking after small children, looking after dependents, persons with disabilities, and older members of the household. Uh, so we see this very clearly. So it's really a lot about the way in which we are socialized and gender socialization is very much still alive. We do require our boys and girls to perform different duties at home. And it just carries um, forward, you know. Um, and the four and a half hours that women in Jamaica spend engaged in unpaid care and domestic work per day is the global average. Right across the world, the average um, number of um, hours that women spend in unpaid care and domestic work is four and a half hours per day. Yeah, so Jamaica is right there with, with, with us. With, I mean, sorry, the rest of the world. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's surprising and, and, and shocking to hear because Jamaica as an economy with a fairly high participation rate of women. Yes. So when you sort of add that to the, to the paid work mm -hmm. and the other responsibilities, mm -hmm. you know, you come up with a, you, you get a sense of the gender and social dimensions of this problem. Yes. But I want to say though, um, that's an important um, point that you just raised, Damien, because if you, if, you, if you pair unpaid care and domestic work with no paid work, you will see that in terms of the activities, all of the activities that men and women are engaged in per day, men spend a higher percentage of their time engaged in paid work, yes, than mm -hmm. women do. So it's about 1.6 times more they spend in paid work, men, than women do. You know, there is a call by people like Diane Elson um, to impose these the three R's. So to recognize that, you know, unpaid care and domestic work is something to be valued and to redistribute it, reduce and redistribute. Yeah. But I think we have to be careful in the redistribution because you don't want for the opportunity cost to be high. Yes. You see? And there are some women who, by choice, are engaged in unpaid care and domestic work. So I could decide that, you know, for maybe a, the first five years of my children growing up, I will decide to stay at home and as a woman, yeah. you know? But you say you, you, you bring up the choice issue now. Yes. And that makes interpreting the data quite complicated. Right. Because we were actually discussing this before. Yes. Priya yeah. and I. That is, we see that women are doing two thirds of the domestic work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does sound unfair, yes. but to be provocative, how do we know that that is not what economists would call an optimal outcome? Yes. Because women do, in fact, yes. want to provide a lot of that care work. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, how do we, you know, taking account of that, how do we interpret the data? Maybe this is uh, what it ought to be. I would and say... I say that hesitantly. 
<laughs> and then I want to say something. Sure, okay. sure. You speak. Yes. Okay, so for this, seeing this gender division of labor, I would say it really stems from the Jamaican family structure because in these families, men are seen as the breadwinners where their prime role is to do paid work while the women's the women are expected to be nurturers and data actually supports this because in 2020 approximately 18,000 women Jamaican women mm -hmm. stated that they were out of the labor force simply because they had home duties and they had to stay home with with dependents mm -hmm. so we can see that women's role it's it's ingrained in them to be nurturers and men are to be the breadwinners to go out and do paid work the point you make about men as breadwinners, that's not only in Jamaica, eh? that's yes, right that's across global. the Caribbean and that's almost global. Yes. But Damien, you know, there are two questions that we have not analyzed mm -hmm. from the time use module. And these are qualitative questions, which I believe might help to answer the question you posed. And these are questions of all the activities that you were engaged in. Which ones did you like most? And which ones did you like least? And I think if we see least, if we see unpaid care work coming up least, you know, as the thing least liked, yes. it might be able to help to answer that issue about choice, you know? Yeah. Yes, so Absolutely. that is a piece of work that is um, not yet done by um, And we need, by to, us, we need to focus you know? on, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, get onto slider.com, put in the event code Capri, and you can pose questions for our panelists. We have a question from Gina who is asking, do you think location is an important factor, Heather, mm -hmm. when we address the amount of unpaid work that is done by each of the two genders? Location. Mm -hmm. So we saw more time spent and a larger percentage of women in the rural areas engaged yes. in unpaid care and domestic work. So location is important. So location is important. And we will, and, and if, you, if you think about uh, geographical location and the prevalence of poverty in Jamaica, you know that rural areas and poverty go pretty much hand in hand. Um, women, also the, the availability of opportunities for employment are far less in rural areas than they are in urban centers, you know, like other towns and the Kingston, greater Kingston metropolitan area. So yes, I would say that area is, is, is a factor. What other, I mean, since somebody puts in location and you have a lot of experience with this kind of data, mm -hmm. what other dimension would be important? Consumption status, what we call quintile right. in the SLC. So poorer women, we saw them doing higher percentages of poor women, poorer women are engaged in unpaid care and domestic work and spend um, more time. So wealthier women are able, by virtue of the fact that they more, of, more likely are working, engaged in paid work, and also have more resources, they are able to purchase assistance through household helpers and gardeners and so on. And so their household don't engage in unpaid care and domestic work as much. In other words, they don't spend as many hours and their participation rates are not as high. So um, we also saw to some extent age, to some yes. extent age. Priya, if you yes, the age, mm -hmm. um, age group 25 to 34, women yes. especially, they had the highest percentage, highest participation rates for care work. And this is probably because this is a prime childbearing age. Yes, it is. Right. So yeah. they are mainly focused on mm -hmm. caring for their yeah, children. It's also the prime productive age. Yes, yes. So it's also the prime productive <laughs> yes. age. Yes, yes, yes. And that makes it an even greater issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. It also occurs to me in this, you know, in this context of having this, this huge problem with unpaid work. And th this thought is stimulated by a question that Tamika is asking about the productivity loss that comes from this. Now, in the presentation and in the report, it speaks about what a great loss it is to total production. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking specifically now of Jamaica's record low unemployment rate. We have the lowest unemployment rate we have had in 
yes. recorded history, economic history, mm -hmm. at six percent. And at six percent, economists are tempted to call that full employment. Mm -hmm. And if you speak to business persons, they will tell you the difficulty of finding labor. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean now that we have you know more or less full employment? Does that really exacerbate and make even more important? the low productivity that we are getting because of the burden of un un unpaid care work. Definitely, definitely. Because if you say we are at full employment at 6%, this means that the available labor force that we have now, the existing labor force, we have to make them more productive to, to, to grow the economy. And our report revealed that a lot of the, product, the productive capacity they are not being realized because they are burdened by unpaid care and domestic work. So definitely addressing the issue of unpaid care and domestic work is important. Mm -hmm. But it also brings up the, um, the, the issue, Damien, of employers perhaps having to assist um, women in particular who are working, you know, and having, still having to carry the unpaid care and domestic work burden, um, you know, with some kind of facility for child care, you know, the state also having to give some, um, some assistance where child care um, services are concerned. Well, one of our recommendations mm -hmm. is that in government agencies, that they take the lead in setting up child care facilities, yes. Yes. Uh, which is not just a demonstration effect. Mm. I mean, you know, government is like one third of the of the economy mm -hmm. by some measures mm -hmm. but but how do we sort of get the private sector to to you know get on board with this kind of exercise well i think you are doing another study if i if i remember correctly um looking at private sector entities um services in this area of child care i think the private sector perhaps has led in Jamaica, there are some private sector entities that have provided childcare facilities for their employees. And so I think the government will have to play catch up. But, but it's not just children, you know, it's also, el it's also right. seniors. So right. some people are, this, some of us are in the sandwich generation where we are raising children <laughs> right. and we are looking after older parents. And so you want to have facilities where you can maybe daycare, you drop off your elderly parent, yes. et cetera. So there are market opportunities for, um, for such services. But I would say so far what I have seen by way of child care facilities available at workplaces, I think it's being led largely by the private sector. Yes. And I think the public sector is going to have to take catch up. Yes. Uh, a viewer through Slido, is asking if you can give some examples, Priya, of what we mean by marketization of unpaid care and domestic work. Okay, so for... Let me, let me think on that, Damien, and I'll get back to you. Okay, how, I mean, how do we, how do we get the what is an unpaid activity? Mm -hmm. How do we get it to be a paid activity? Okay, so first, so, as I mentioned, that's what they're really asking. First, as I mentioned in in the presentation, there we have to look at why what is preventing the growth of the care sector. So, so the limitations and constraints. These include we don't have enough trained caregivers. We don't have enough money to to for to cover the sack of course. We don't have available infrastructure so by knowing these constraints we can and and as well as knowing the value of the care sector we can have an idea of what can we what can we do going forward that is what i mean by marketization okay but damien i want to say that you know this care sector mm -hmm. and care economy these are new terms to us in the region yeah people so i mean Care work was seen as something that anybody could do. Right. So it never really had any status. We are now giving some status and recognition and visibility and so on. Yes. So this is something that is new to the society, I would say. Well, since, you know, since you say that, 
mm-hmm. and and credit to you mm-hmm. for you know getting the data collected so that we can pay attention to it and credit the prayer yes. for doing the work mm-hmm. but to what extent you think mm-hmm. that this discussion is relatively new is as a result of in Caribbean society most of the decision makers and most of the political decision makers have been men um i don't know if i want well there perhaps is a gender dimension to this but i don't want to necessarily say that it's because men have been you know or we have been operating in a patriarchal society and system Mm -hmm. that that may be the only reason why um you know the issue of care work and the valuing of care work has um has been um not at the forefront or not not recognized um I don't want to necessarily say that it's only because of patriarchy. Right. Um, I have a, f- well, you know, and I may get some flogging from, you know, some of my colleagues, but I would say that generally speaking, you know how we have valued, we have tended as societies to value certain things. So anything having, I mean, think of garbage collection. It's la- it was largely done by men. And how was it valued? It didn't take, um, remember that our societies are meritocracies where achieve, it's achievement, it's certification and so on that ends up valuing, causing value. Yes. And so when you think that care work is something that could be um, done by any and everybody, you know, or garbage collection, you know, any and everybody could do that. It doesn't take a lot of education and skill and that kind of thing. People they won't are, see it as valuable. People wouldn't see it as valuable. Yeah, they won't see it right? as valuable. They don't enjoy any status yes. in society. So I don't want to necessarily say that it was, you know, because of patriarchy yeah. why we um why unpaid care and domestic work has not been recognized and properly valued. But I do take the view of um some of my colleagues, you know, that it is on account of um patriarchy. I can understand where they're coming from, yeah. but I would say that merit societies that are meritocracies tend to have that issue so here is uh, another uh, viewer through slido.com who has who is adding another dimension to how we analyze this unpaid care Mm -hmm. work problem cheryl says the majority of jamaican households are Mm female-headed what are the implications of that dimension for unpaid work when women are the only breadwinner winner in the household. Mm-hmm. So you could imagine the double burden that right, women exactly. Definitely. Because if they are engaged in paid work, you could imagine, and especially if they are poor, because a lot of, I mean, female-headed households, I'm not saying that it, it's not seen across all socioeconomic categories, but in the poorer households, you would find a larger percentage of, of them um, being female-headed. And they are also the breadwinners. Mm-hmm. So they have to be engaged in, um, in that double burden. Yes. And the ones that end up with and the children. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I would hazard to suggest, uh, prayer that this consideration makes the problem of unpaid work even more important than the estimate suggests, you know, than, than the 45% mm-hmm. suggests. Mm-hmm. Because of the concentration of the burden, yes, Heather, yes, on, yes. On, on women. Yes. And so for women to be able to engage in paid work, they really need to be helped to reduce the to reduce the, the that, work. The, yes. that, that you know burden of, of engagement in unpaid care and domestic work. They really need that. But you have to be careful how you reduce and this is where for me, this is where state the state and employers need to help. I don't necessarily agree that in reducing women's um, unpaid care and domestic work in the household, it necessarily must go to the man. Because if he is bringing in 
You see, if right, you right. want him to reduce his engagement in paid work, it might be more detrimental to the welfare yeah. of the household. I agree. And so one has to be careful yes. with this, you know, um, discussion about redistributing yes. within the household. Yeah. So we have, you have two recommendations in the report. One is that state agencies should try to establish facilities mm -hmm. for child care. Uh, and the other one is that the sector needs to be subsidized. And the argument for the subsidy uh, is really, I would think, Heather, mm -hmm. because of the detrimental social consequences more than the economic cost. Yes. But somebody on Slido mm -hmm. wants to understand the voucher thing better. Um, so just you know, talk for a few seconds about how that works. Okay, so with the voucher, the, the state would subsidize it through PATH. So you can redeem the voucher at any of these care facilities. And how we are doing this, we're, we're, we are suggesting doing it by the demand side, not the supply side. Because the demand side would stimulate competition and this would end up making the market for the vouchers be more, comp be more efficient. I would say. Okay. So the vouchers are issued to the, the people who have the care burden, mm -hmm. the, the caregivers, whoever they are. Yes. Um, and then they take it to the facility, to the business that is offering childcare services or senior citizens' homes. And then those facilities then redeem them from the government. Yes. Mm -hmm. Another option would be to just give the money directly to the to the providers. Mm -hmm. Why not that option? Why why use vouchers instead? Because that 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 can we can end up in a situation where they end up getting most of the profit of of this voucher system, which we don't want that. I think I've seen both um, both models used in Canada. Um, I was on a study tour a couple of years ago with a team from the Planning Institute. Okay. And I think I saw both the voucher where the actual household receives a voucher, which subsidizes mm -hmm. the um, child care. So they can take it to any of their preferred child care. And I've also seen where the government, um, you know, um, in other words, pays the child care facility. Right. And so, you know, the household doesn't get the voucher in hand or any money in hand. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I wanted to, to I, I want to think that I think we need to use some of our community services and resources more in countries like ours. Also. So, for example, use some of our retirees. We have retired teachers. We have retired nurses. I was just thinking that, you know, perhaps in some of these community centers, we can pay a stipend to or something to a retired nurse, a retired teacher, somebody yes. who is trained, yes. who where you can feel comfortable as a mother or a father taking a small child to be held for the day and using the resources of the community. So if it's a rural area, using the farmers who produce um, food yes. for the community, let them produce the, or supply the facility with their um, service goods and you know, produce. And so this community benefits. The co so it's a win-win for the community. I, I, I mean, yeah. I haven't thought it through what, you know, fully, but I'm thinking that that could, be something that could be something that we use. We also have the flexi work legislation. I don't know how much we, um, how many employers are really using or, you know, or are encouraging the employees to take up the arrangement, but. Um, you know, it might be useful sometimes for a mother to work in yeah, the it's, evening it's a rather friendly. than the morning. Something more. It's a family you know, friendly. Family um, friendly. Yes. As an economist, I don't understand. And of course, many things could follow that sentence because there are many things economists don't understand. <laughs> but I don't understand why it actually needs legislation. Because it seems to me that there would be an advantage mm -hmm. to a business to organize his employment arrangements, either through providing a facility or through flexi work, mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage of highly productive, motivated people yes. 
yes. who have the problem of 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 care yes. of care work. Yes. Yes. And, really and so anybody who's not providing that facility and mm -hmm. that accommodation mm -hmm. is not getting the best employees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Heather, what do you think about the paternity leave being being an option in Jamaica? Because it's it's in the plans. Do you think that can help address the burden of care work? I think it's in I think paternity leave is important. Um I I feel that paternity leave should be afforded men who are in stable um, relationships and are cohabiting. Um, this is my view that they should but that's, be that can be a problem in the current. That's, going, that's, that's going likely to be a problem, to be a problem yes. you know. But I feel that men in stable relationships should be given the opportunity to engage in the socialization, the care and nurture of their children and the yes. bonding with a with a with a child a newborn is very important i think it will also soften some men you know will be softened by an experience of having to engage in the nurture the and early, it will also take nurture, some burden off of the woman and it will take the burden off the woman so some of the burden well some yes, some, some of the burden so i i don't i am a big supporter of paternity leave yes, as yes. to for how long now that's where we can get into, you know, some kind of some um, problems, yes. you know, problems. Yeah, I mean, some of the burden, you know, some of us just don't have the plumbing to do <laughs> part of the burden. But, yes. but th th that's intriguing because if you think that there is a, if you point out that there is a benefit mm -hmm. to getting that bond stronger, mm -hmm. you know, between the father and newborn, mm -hmm. then that holds out the possibility that because there is a bond, mm -hmm. then the father will more likely want to take on some of that care work yes. later yes. on. Yes, yes. The bond yes. having been established. Yes. yes. So yes. and really I never thought of paternity leave, you know, in this context. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I think so. I think it, it it would be very useful once it's implemented in, in in a proper way. Yeah. Well I you know I certainly think so. Listen you know what this discussion is bringing us back to? How very important the family is. I mean, it is the absolute basic institution, critical institution. Yes. Without